In this episode, we'll talk a bit about the confusion about objectivity and subjectivity in sensory methodology. Be careful about what is meant by objectivity and subjectivity when dealing with sensory data and sensory method. I would suggest skipping completely the term subjectivity as it has a lot of old connotations that are misleading and keep sensory science in a hazy place where it's not really considered an objective science, which it is. Objective knowledge is, according to empiricism's knowledge, which is based on an experiment so well described and so well aligned with natural laws that everybody doing the experiment the same way will draw the same conclusions and therefore be untainted by subjective bias. Somebody might refer to sensory science as objective knowledge about subjective experience. I would prefer to substitute subjective in this sentence with first-person experience. And rather than relating the term objective to resting on the solid grounds of the outer physical world, I would interpret the concept objectivity to the correct use of method. To relate objective and subjective to the outer and inner world creates a lot of confusion and is a problem for sensory science. I think there is a useful approach to this problem in Western philosophy of knowledge. Phenomenology, and particularly Husserl's approach, could be helpful. He has a concept for the fundamental elements of experience and knowledge he calls intentionality which describes the fact that all experience is happening for a subject about an object, regardless if the object is a physical object experienced through the senses or an inner object such as thoughts or particularly mathematical concepts for Husserl, but also feelings. All experiences and systematic knowledge as such is based on the meeting of some object before a subject regardless if the object is later interpreted as either existing in the inner or outer world. The problematic and misleading use of subjectivity as a a miscredited source of data is explored in books like The Taboo of Subjectivity, Towards a New Science of Consciousness by Alan Wallace, Trusting the Subject by Andreas Repstorff, and The View from Within by Francisco Varela. Varela particularly developed an approach to investigating the mind from both the inside and outside of human experience, and he called this approach neurophenomenology. He claimed that unbiased knowledge can be acquired in both domains and that the best models of understanding interactions of mind and matter is to have two parallel descriptions that does not try to reduce one to the other. Often neurologists tend to not really give first-person accounts, thoughts and feelings, much validity, as they don't perceive it as really reliable compared to the electrical and chemical measurements in the brain. And in the other extreme, some philosophers, such as particularly Husserl's Kronprinz Heidegger, who developed a radical fusion of phenomenology and hermeneutics, he tends to see natural sciences as dealing with non-fundamental or superficial aspects of reality. Neurophenomenology insists on taking both domains seriously in their own right and builds models that where both domains are equally represented in the final model of explanations. Why do I think these distinctions are relevant in our context of this podcast? It is because there seems to be a confusion regarding the reliability sources or the reliable sources of solid knowledge. It happens every time somebody says, sensory science, how can you make a science about subjective experience? At the root of this claim is the misunderstanding that reliable data cannot be extracted from inner experience, called first-person accounts. Objectivity is rooted in the methodology applied, and for a sensory scientist, a panel of couples describing intensities of a sample set is objective investigation or first-person experience of 
intensities of descriptors of examples, and a consumer study is objective in investigation on first-person experience of preferences of samples. It is highly clarifying to write first-person experience rather than subjective here, as avoiding the term subjective makes sure to not miscredit any part of the methods of being biased or less objective than any other science. So let's look at how a sensory descriptive analysis is objective and how it collects data from first-person experience without having to be tainted by the miscredited word subjective in the explanation. And in this example, uh, you can see how you can quantify objectively intensities of sensory data. Here we go. Everybody has had a hearing test during their life, and the setup is nice and simple. It is based on headphones with sound of extremely controlled frequency and volume, which are mounted on the test person's head. And here the person reports back with a simple press of a button every time a frequency is perceived by the test person. By placing a lot of, uh, by playing a lot of frequencies and volume combinations in both ears, it is possible to create a very precise picture of the hearing capabilities of the test person across frequencies in both ears. This is a precise quantification of a person's inner experience, and I think it is misleading to call it subjective experience, because in some meanings of the word subjective, uh, it is miscredited as opposed to objective experience, which for some people implied the solid outer world. As already mentioned earlier, I think that we should just talk about experiences of the inner and outer world respectively, and call them scientific if the data are collected correctly according to the state-of-the-art scientific methodology. Talking about subjective or objective experience has too heavy a historical miscrediting of subjective or first-person or inner experiences to be useful and avoid misunderstandings when we build scientific models about inner experience, such as with sensory data. So how does objective and subjective relate to descriptive and preferences, which are concepts all used uh, frequently in uh, sensory methods? If you have read the new Coffee Sensory and Coffee uh, Handbook from SCA, um, the passage about objectivity and subjectivity is not very clear, nor actionable. And I think the root of this, uh, again, is the a uh, lack of correct distinction. So to quote the handbook, in this handbook, we shall understand objective and subjective in a very concrete way. If we are referring to an analytical quality of the coffee sensory experience, we call it objective. If we are referring to a value judgment, even of a very specific attribute, we should consider it subjective. So here they distinguish between um, the value judgment and um, on, on the one hand and, um, and the description of, on the other hand, which I think is uh, useful, but using objective and subjective here is really confusing. So why confuse the situation by talking about subjective and objective at all if it do, if it doesn't clarify the situation. In the above passage, it seems that value judgment, hedonic or liking, effective preference quality, it's got many names, but the value judgment is subjective data. But I don't agree. When doing consumer data, you collect value judgment data because you collect preferences data. But I would call those objective data. The data are objective data about first-person experience. Calling these data subjective just adds to the historical skeptical approach to subjective data as such, and there is no reason that we continue to support this. They are objective because the correct methods uh, is used and described uh, uh, specific enough for anybody else to repeat the project and end at the same conclusions. I would call it scientific valid data about 
personal preference reported by the consumer, which is data from, coming from inner experience. Just stick to the outer and inner world of human experience on, and for the inner experiences, distinguish between descriptive and preference data, which correlates to intensity and quality. It does not need to be more complicated than that, than that. But these distinctions seem to be useful in simplifying and clarifying the way we talk about this. When I did my master's thesis about uh, meditation psychology, this was an extremely important point, and if you think that you are entering a difficult area by having to distinguish between descriptive and preference data in the inner world, try discussing different states of consciousness and ultimately an ultimate emptiness uh, in Buddhism and staying inside a scientific approach. The scientific work done in the era, era of neurophenomenology by Varela and his uh, colleagues, on questions around meditation has proven that it is indeed possible to make reliable scientific, scientific projects on even very advanced and subtle types of first-person experience. So in this regard, sensory science seems like a walk in the park when it comes to defining and using the basic concepts correctly from a scientific point of view, if you remember the above simple model of distinction. Outer and inner world, and in the inner world, it can be divided into respectively intensities and qualities. That's it. By dropping subjective and objective, we get less confused and are less likely to, dis be, uh, to discredit reported data about inner experience. And it will be easier to discuss sensory methodology in the coffee business, which seems completely confused about the above mentioned distinction as exemplified in the SCA copying form which uh, mixes everything up for everybody even more. So let's look at the category error, mixing chemical concepts and coffee lingo in the SCA, SCA flavor wheel. Don't get me wrong here, I like the SCA flavor wheel. I just have a comment on how sometimes choosing a method which is not completely aligned with the later use of the data can lead to confusion for the audience using it. This falls under the form follow function uh, point in the uh, points of a good theory. If the purpose with the work behind the flavor wheel was to create an educational tool for the community, it is extremely important to weed out any possible sources of ambiguity when, uh, which could cause confusion and wrong uses of concepts in the community. The tool is trying to help. The SCA flavor wheel is created by having a panel of professional coffee tasters come up with descriptors, putting words on perceived sensory experience, for a wide range of coffees. For some reason, some of these professional tasters have added acetic acid, butyric acid, isovaleric acid, citric acid, and malic acid, as if it is a scientific fact that it is possible and relevant to distinguish this in coffee, as if the human senses are able to distinguish individual chemical substances like this in the concentration they appear in in coffee. The flavor notes were then uh, presented to a larger group of coffee professionals who provided their opinion on how to group these flavor notes reported by the panel. All these data were analyzed using a state-of-the-art scientific data analysis, a method called cluster analysis, which then created the organization of the SEA flavor wheel as we know it. But this flavor wheel is now adopted as the standard for the global coffee community as a reference tool to describe and organize flavors when, with, when tasting coffees. The community trusts it because it is developed using a scientific method and people would assume that this, the distinction between first-person data, sensory impressions, and outer-world data, which is chemical substances, is correctly handled. This is what they imagine. And also imagine how many people would uh, have been looking at the SEA flavor wheel and seen acetic acid, butyric acid, isovaleric acid, citric acid, and malic acid, only to trust that it is possible and relevant to use these in sensory analysis and started to use it uh, and speak about it with peers and customers. This is an example of how a correct method used in a wrong context can have huge cost for the community who will start to use it 
in a confusion and incorrect manner. Everything has been done correctly after the method has been selected, but the, selected, uh, the method selected up against the final purpose was not optimal, and that can lead to huge cost for many people in the global community. Also, a good example of what happens if the distinction between the inner sensory experience and outer chemical substances is not kept at the forefront of thinking, which is uh, which I think is one of the most important distinctions at all when dealing with sensory methodology during uh, creation and interpretation of research projects and community education curricula. Another example of the wrong method leading to a wrong a lot of confusion is the research papers using the SCA copying form as an endpoint for an assessment of quality for some experiential factors. So people are changing something in some uh, uh, processing of coffee, green coffee, roasting, whatever, and then using the SCA copying form as endpoint for measuring the effect of it. I seriously think that all scientific publication ever that has been using the SCA copying form as an endpoint for assessment of quality for some experiential factors should have been rejected as a scientific paper because the method is neither fit as a description of the coffees nor providing a meaningful concept of quality that can be used strategically for consumer preferences prediction. If you sit between two chairs, you fall to the ground.